Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Rebecca Naus, who is a support specialist at the SUNY Library Services. Is that correct? We, what we call SUNY Central. Um, and she previously was the Discovery Services Librarian at University at Albany. And with her is her colleague, Lauren Pusher, who is a user experience library at University at Albany. And I'm going to turn it over to them to uh, provide any more details about themselves. Thanks. Thank Just get you. my presentation up and we'll get started. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, as Susan said, uh, I'm Rebecca Naus, and Lauren Pusher and I are going to share a little bit about our experience with virtual browsing in a discovery environment using a feature called Collection Discovery. So for a little bit of context, let's take a look at exploratory research and the value of browsing your library collections. Exploratory research is a research method that's usually used for open-ended or maybe ill-defined research questions. It's also used a lot um, for research into new or maybe developing fields of study. So knowing that, a lot of the research that's being conducted by students and faculty in higher education really benefit from exploratory research methods. White and Roth describe three phases of exploratory research. Uh, the first is discovery, then learning and investigation. So discovery is the process of finding new information that's helping the researcher inform their research question. Learning is where they're making sense of that information and they're really developing a deeper understanding of the subject. And then investigation is where they're analyzing, they're synthesizing, and they're assessing what they've learned. So libraries can support all three of these phases of the exploratory research process, but we're really going to be focusing on the discovery piece today, which libraries support through facilitating the browsing of their collections. So browsing library collections can happen physically in the stacks in your buildings, or it can happen online through things like your research guides, your website, your A to Z list, um, or your catalog, of course. And today we're really going to focus on browsing in the stacks and in the catalog. Um, browsing in the stacks is usually it's a visual and it's a tactile experience. So people are seeing resources that are related to something they've found because they're located nearby on the shelf. And they're taking that book off the shelf. They're flipping through it. They're scanning the table of contents. So they're really um, interacting with your materials. It also is usually subject-based because of the ways libraries organize their collections. Of course, there can be exceptions to that, but typically um, your typical collections are organized by subject. And so that's typically how your researchers would be browsing them. And it's also really a researcher driven action. It's happening organically as your researchers are moving through the stacks and they're searching for and finding resources. So browsing the catalog is a very different experience uh, than browsing the stacks typically. Um, it's quite text heavy. If you think about browsing through long lists of bibliographic records um, in a results list, it's also more flexible than physical browsing in that the results that your researchers are seeing can really vary depending on the search terms they're using or the type of search that they're doing. They're not necessarily getting um, 
they're not necessarily doing subject searching and getting lists of results with that particular subject. It can also bring together items that wouldn't necessarily be shelved near each other in the stacks, but that might still be of interest uh, to your researcher. So there are some limitations to both of these. Could you go back real quick, Lauren? I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there are some limitations uh, to both of these ways of, of browsing your collections, which we'll touch on in a minute. But there are also some really great benefits to the ability to browse your collections. Research shows that browsing and those chance information encounters that your researchers have while they're browsing really can spark research interests. They help your, your researchers better understand and define their research questions. They stimulate intellectual curiosity and really engages your researchers in the knowledge creation process. So we're seeing that this serendipitous discovery of browsing is really, really powerful. Okay, next slide, thank you. So I guess, why are we talking about this? We already have physical spaces to browse. We already have library catalogs for researchers to browse. So what's the issue? Um, the issue is that there are some some real limitations to both of these methods of browsing your collections. Things like moving your physical items from your browsable stacks to places like on-site or off-site storage spaces can really remove them from that browsing experience. Uh, your libraries now have probably returned to normal operations but if you remember back to not that long ago, at the height of the pandemic, many libraries had reduced hours or might have been closed entirely, which would definitely impact your researcher's ability to browse your, your library's physical collections. There's also been an increase in remote teaching and learning. So with more students and faculty engaging with your library's collections remotely, they're Browsing um, is really limited to browsing through the online presence. They don't have the ability necessarily to browse your physical collections. Um, there's also been the, the steady uh, transition to online resources, which are great in so many ways, but uh, one way they're not so great is <laughs> in terms of being able to physically browse your collections um, because they don't, they don't show in the stacks when somebody is there. And of course, we have the library catalog, which are another great way, uh, which is another great way to browse and discover your library's collections, but there are also limitations there. Um, if you think about things like the quality of the metadata in your bibliographic records, which can vary wildly, um, changes to cataloging practices over time, um, cataloging discretion and, and the different ways that different catalogers might describe something can all impact whether or not records for relevant resources would would be displayed to your researchers in their search results. There's also um, the issue of language in that the, the language used in cataloging doesn't necessarily correspond to the language your researchers are using while they're searching. So of course that can greatly impact the results that they'll see. In a discovery environment, um, if you're using a discovery tool that incorporates article level records, in addition to any of your title level records, the sheer number of results can be an impediment um, to browsing. And your the relevancy ranking algorithms that the discovery tools are using are pretty opaque, they're, they, they're, they're not transparent, and um, they don't necessarily return the most relevant results to the top of the list, and your researchers might not realize that. 
So what do we do about this? Is there some way to bring a more holistic browsing experience to researchers? This question was really at the heart of why we began looking into collection discovery at UAlbany. So collection discovery uh, is a feature of Alma and Primo, and it allows libraries to create curated, browsable, and visually appealing collections for your researchers. It's just what you Albany was looking for, and we were very lucky in that it was available to us as a library using Alma and Primo. Next slide, please. So just to highlight some things that we really, really appreciated about it. We really liked how collection discovery was integrated into the discovery experience. So there's a collection lobby, which is basically a landing page for all of the collections that our librarians have created. And each collection can be linked to individually. So it's really easy to incorporate them into research guides, into learning management systems for your online courses, to web pages, really anywhere that you would want to share a collection, you can easily do it. Um, collections are also discoverable in search results. So someone doesn't have to click on, we call our collection discovery, our collection discovery curated collections. Someone doesn't have to click on that curated collections link to find collections. Um, they will appear in search results along with any other resources that the library offers. So they are, they're findable in that way too. Collection information also shows in our bibliographic records. So if somebody were to happen upon a record for an item that's in a collection, they will also see in the record for that item a link to that collection. They'll see that it's part of a collection. They'll see a link to that collection. Um, and they'll also see a visual collection browse, which would which allows them to visually see what else is available in that collection without even having to leave the record. They can scroll through and they can click and be brought to a record for that item. So it's, it's very integrated into the search and the discovery experience. But <laughs> you don't necessarily need Alma and Primo to do something similar at your library. There are plenty of freely available or subscription tools like these ones that can help you to create browsable collections of your resources. They won't necessarily have all of the same features as collection discovery, but you can use them to create those curated collections of, resource, of resources that you can share with your researchers, and they can be a really great alternative if you don't have access um, to Alma and Primo. Thanks, Rebecca. So I'm going to walk through how we got started using this feature. Um, then I'll show you how easy it is to create a collection. We'll look at some examples of what we're doing and what other institutions are doing. Uh, but as Rebecca mentioned, uh, we really jumped into this project together, working together, um, and we dug into this collection discovery feature just to learn more about what it does. When it had first come out and uh, we were on a committee that looked at it, we it was so new, like we didn't really understand it or what what could you even do with it? So we started looking around, trying to find who else was using it and you know what types of collections were people building with this tool. So uh, so we we did that and we worked on building our first sample collections uh, just to demonstrate the potential to the 
director of our collections department. And during that phase, we had documented our building process, just so we'd remember what we did. <laughs> it was really for ourselves. Um, so we put all this information of what we were doing each step of the way into a lib guide uh, to have on hand. And then we showcased that pilot collection uh, to the head of collections who really liked it, saw a lot of potential as far as how our subject librarians would be able to build collections and then use them for outreach and teaching. So we were able to meet with this group of librarians and uh, discuss with them what it was and how it could be used to highlight unique aspects of our collections at UAltney. So while we were, you know, investigating all of this, we also learned that anybody that was going to be able to build collections needed specific advanced uh, permissions in Alma to use the feature. So initially, this was a concern due to our focus on system security and our practice of limiting permissions uh, and access. However, we did make a compelling case for the role of librarians and the importance of collection discovery in promoting the resources we already have. So that worked, <laughs> fortunately. And everybody was able to get the proper permissions to use the feature. Uh, interest was high after that initial meeting. Uh, with the librarians where we showed off our first collection and talked about all the great things we thought you could do with it. Uh, and that led us into our next step and that was staff training. So everyone who was interested, now they needed to go through the training process. So fortunately, as I mentioned, during our pilot testing phase, we had put together this great documentation for ourselves. So we just made that a loop guide that was available to anyone to view. Um, and it really walks you through building got, uh, these collections and all the ins and outs and things to think about. So we had that ready to share. And I also prepared a step-by-step -step video tutorial uh, to assist our staff. So after we got a list of who was interested, we set up, I think it was two in-person training sessions and invited the librarians to come and talk to us and we talked about ideas that they had for collections and we walked through the actual building process and then once those sessions were over and we made sure all of our staff had the necessary permissions the librarians were then encouraged to start creating collections at their own pace. So early examples of collections included a collection on publications from our sociology faculty and also a selection of mystery books. Those were like the first ones I remember. I was so excited to see those published. <laughs> and whenever questions came up, the librarians would just reach out to Rebecca or myself and I, we'd probably chat about it, find an answer and get back to them as soon as we could. So one question that came up was, how are we going to manage this? And we didn't really have a plan going into it, except that we knew we wanted the librarians to be able to build their own collections. So there was not like one single person that was that management authority. We didn't want, you know, Rebecca to have to build all the collections for everybody. Like it, that was not possible. <laughs> so, uh, so as I mentioned, you know, we, that's why we pushed to get the librarians to have the proper permissions in the system so that they could do this on their own and create their own collections. And some of the benefits from this model that we saw, you know, besides one of us not having all this work to do, was that, you know, there was more ownership of the collections when the librarians and staff have that autonomy to create their own collections. They're more engaged and invested, I feel, in the quality and the relevance of those collections. You know, it's special and it's, it's their own thing. Also, our librarians have subject expertise. Uh, they've got specialized knowledge in their own fields. They're aware of emerging trends in the fields or current events. You know, they, they're able to create collections that 
a, so a generalist librarian like myself wouldn't be able to do. Also responsiveness, uh, you know, allowing individual librarians to create these means that they can be created more quickly in response to things like user needs, or like I mentioned, current events. So I think that we see like more action in our collections than we would if we didn't have everybody in there. Um, diversity of collections, I mean, we can have collections on all subjects and topics, whatever our folks are expertise in or they want to share, um, they're able to do that. And of course, efficiency. It's not, you know, centralized under one person waiting to get through a list of collections. We're able to get up and do them as we go. So one of the most exciting aspects of this project for me personally was this cross-departmental collaboration. Uh, our public services librarians, we teamed up with the tech services department and discovery services, you know, and we were able to bring these collections to life. So it was, I found it personally really fun to work, you know, with these other departments that we probably just don't usually work with day to day to create something exciting. Now, I serve as a go-to person today for any questions about the process because Rebecca has moved on. So anyone with inquiries can simply email me and I do my best to find the answer for them. Otherwise, this whole process is mostly self-directed with everybody relying on that LibGuide for documentation to uh, create and update their own collection. So it's working out well. Oh, and I was, when I was talking about responsiveness, one example I was going to mention was our subject librarian for uh, pol uh, public policy and political science was able to oversee a collection on the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, right as it was underway. So it, it was just an example of that responsiveness aspect of having everybody in there and able to make collections. Okay, uh, so while we don't have any formal quality control measures in place and the librarians are you know, free to build and publish collections as they see fit, periodically uh, I will review content in Alma just to make sure that everything's displaying correctly. Uh, I've made minor adjustments before for consistency and user friendliness. And in the future, we do plan to bring in our marketing and outreach librarian to assist with strategic promotion. So this would include things like targeted outreach and the creation of collections that align with special library events and community interests. So the big question is, how much time is this going to take? Uh, and the first step is, really just coming up with your collection idea. And it can take some time depending on how easy it is to identify the items that you want to include in a collection. Will you be adding items to your collection one by one, perhaps by ISBN numbers, or will you be adding items logically by setting up a search with different parameters and then using the results list as the items in your collection? Either way is great. and collections can be built, they don't have to be built all at once in one sitting, you can start a collection, build it up over time, add to it as you go along and update it as needed. So we are going to share our documentation with you, which is that LibGuide that I've mentioned. And I wanted to pop over to it now and show you our video tutorial, uh, which is very, it's short, it's under four minutes long, just to show you how simple it really is once you're in there to put these together. So let's hop over there. All right. To build your collection, start in the admin tab of Alma and select manage sets. Then click add set and choose logical. Now add some general information. Add your set name, add a brief description, 
And in the notes field, it's handy to add your search criteria so that if you revisit the set or the collection in the future, you can easily see the search terms you used. Now we can search for the titles you want to include in your set. We recommend using the advanced search because you can include multiple criteria. There are additional options in the advanced search as well. You can search for and add titles one by one if you have a very, very specific set of items you want to include. I'm going to search with LC subject headings. and run my search. You can refine your search with the facets that appear with your results. I'm going to limit my search to books and again to physical books in the collection. And click Save. We get a little message that our set has been saved and now we can head to Resources and Manage Collections. We're going to add a top-level collection and add in some general information. You need to add a title and a name. We recommend adding a description of your collection. And for library, add University Library. You can also add a small thumbnail image that will only appear in the back end Alma view. And click Save. Our collection has been added to the list. We can open it up and add titles. Go to the Title List tab and select Add Titles from Set. Choose your set and click the Add Set Titles button. Next, move to the Discovery tab. This is the Primo Display tab. Choose how you want your titles sorted, and then add your image. This image will display on the Collection Lobby page and your Collection homepage. You can add up to four images, but we recommend one for accessibility purposes. Now click Save and go to Primo and check out your curated collection. It may take up to 15 minutes for titles to be added to the collection. Here's our new collection. And our description and image looks good. We can scroll down, take a look at the books that have been added. Everything looks great. Okay, so three minutes, 42 seconds, and we put together a collection on art crime. Uh, this is our LibGuide, and we will share this link with you at the end of this session. So you can check it out and see what our best practices and tips are in here and um, get inspired. Okay. All right, so we know what it takes to build a collection. So now we're going to look at some of them. As we mentioned earlier, Rebecca mentioned, uh, this is our collections lobby. And um, the collections here, they can all be tailored to specific subjects. They can showcase prominent authors or academic groups if you're a university or a college. They can celebrate particular genres or compiled diverse resources to address campus initiatives. Uh, they could address current events or trending research topics. So there's all sorts of things you can do. And we're, we'll have some ideas during this presentation. Uh, it was our online public interface committee, uh, which has since disbanded, but they were the ones that picked out this name, Curated Collections. And you can edit that, uh, change it as needed, or whatever you would like to call yours. If you click any one of these uh, collection boxes, it's going to take you to a dedicated page with cover images and titles. For example, here's a look at our popular books collection. And this is a rotating showcase of physical books. 
this feature, you know, it's great for off-campus students and online students or off-campus and on-campus students as it provides them with an engaging opportunity to explore the collection from anywhere. They don't have to be here in the library. Um, and it replicates that feel, as Rebecca was mentioning, of physically browsing through a shelf when you're looking through these. This is the art crime collection that we just built together. Uh, so this uh, initially served as one of our early pilot uh, collections to showcase the feature to the staff. It covers art and cultural property crimes. It's a topic that intersects with various University at Albany and Albany Law School programs, such as criminal justice, business, and art history. It's ideal for fans of true crime, art law students, and those intrigued by high profile heists. The collection also resonates with enthusiasts of popular true crime content like Netflix's This Is a Robbery and Hulu's Only Murderers in the Building. These books that you see here, they may not exist together up in the stacks in the building, but here we've brought them together in a browsable collection. And this is our recent collection focused on artificial intelligence, and it's a subject of increasing importance at UAlbany, particularly with the launch of the AI supercomputing initiative. This robust collection is organized into multiple sub collections. It's a great feature, uh, each of which you can explore with a click to discover a carefully curated list of books in that specific area. Our AI subject librarian took the lead in constructing this resource to offer direct support to the initiative. The collection serves as a research tool, not only for those involved in the supercomputing initiative, but also for anyone interested in this growing field of AI. For many years, our children and young adult collection was tucked away in a hard to find location in the library's basement behind the media center. The collection's discovery feature has allowed us to bring this collection into the spotlight by offering a virtual showcase for it. The collection's dedicated page you see here, it provides an overview of the types of materials it includes, and it also highlights the university programs and curricula that the collection supports. This information was not previously available anywhere, so it's great to have it all in one place. One of my favorite collections is our Banned Books Club. This is curated by our marketing and outreach librarian, and running from September to April, the club reads one book each month. Participants can join a monthly discussion and we help to make sure that everybody who's interested can obtain a copy of the book. This collection showcases an entire year worth of book club selections. And we also use curated collections for collaborations and partnerships across campus. The university recently hosted a free speech symposium, September 14th and 15th, and the libraries played an active role in that event. Among our contributions was a banned book readout to highlight the importance of free expression. Additionally, the head of collections created their own curated collection seen here. It's a specialized free speech collection and features recent publications on the subject to enrich the dialogue and provide valuable resources for symposium attendees. And her collection was featured right on the symposium event page. So this was on the university's main website and um, reached a wide audience. So it was really great to have it featured there. And our Latin American and Caribbean handmade books collection is another exciting collaboration that was done between our subject librarian for history and Latin American studies and our university art museum. So the museum has an exhibition that features about 80 books, but the entire collection we have houses over 200 volumes. The books that are not on display are housed in our special collections, which is their permanent residence. Throughout the semester, the exhibit will rotate to showcase a majority of the volumes. 
The curated collection spotlights these handmade books that are all published by small presses in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Mexico, and several South American countries. And as you can see here, there are four sub collections underneath the main collection. So the works are all grouped under different categories for browsing. This collection is also featured prominently on the university's museum website uh, with a link actually, if you can see it, right above the exhibition brochure. So we got great visibility for this one uh, and we're getting a lot of attention for it. Something to note regarding this collection. So originally the collection of handmade artist books, it had a challenge, there was a challenge they didn't have cover images. <laughs> so we um, we pull our cover images through Syndetics, but these are special, unique handmade items. So obviously you weren't going to get um, an image coming through Syndetics for these. Uh, so when they were added to our collections feature here, it all you could see was like a gray generic book cover image and the title, and it was not, very stunning. It wasn't visually engaging or anything like that. Uh, so <laughs> we had to address this and the subject librarian that was working on this project collaborated with our systems and discovery services departments to develop custom coding that allowed us to insert thumbnail images into the item records, which are now beautifully displayed within the virtual collections. And our subject librarian uh, was able to take these wonderful cover images to upload as thumbnails. And now um, I wanted to show some more collections from other libraries that we find very inspiring. So this one is from the University of California, Irvine, and they've curated this diversity award-winning books collection. And I think it really stands out for its depth and focus. It's organized into the various sub collections and each one spotlights books that have received specific diversity related awards. This format not only celebrates the achievements of diverse authors and subjects, but it also allows users to easily navigate and discover literature um, the way that they have it broken down into these sub 29 sub collections. I just am really impressed by this one. Naugatuck Valley Community College offers a cooking resources collection that caters to culinary enthusiasts of all levels. This collection, not it includes not only an array of print cookbooks, but also a wide variety of instructional videos. It covers a broad spectrum of cuisines, techniques, and culinary traditions. The University at Buffalo Libraries have a Game On collection that features books on competitive gaming, video games, and video game culture. This is of particular interest to us because UAlbany competes alongside 56 other schools in the Eastern College Athletic Conference, and we have a brand new esports arena that is going to be opening next fall, so we really like this idea. The Spencer Art Library at the Nelson Atkins Museum has carefully curated a collection titled Orderly Nature, Gardens and Art History. And this collection explores the relationship between gardens and art. It highlights how gardens have been integral to part of various cultures around the world and how they've been richly depicted in artistic works throughout history. This is a look at the Gardens and Art sub-collection they have, and it features titles focusing not only on how gardens are portrayed in art, but also on gardens that have inspired the artists themselves. And lastly, I'd like to highlight a unique collection from the University of Kentucky, which offers board games for loan over here on the right. Uh, this is the first instance I've encountered of a library featuring this type of collection, and it serves as a good example of how libraries can extend beyond traditional academic resources and offer engaging interactive materials for patrons. So when talking to students, uh, they've expressed appreciation for the curated collections, and in particular, 
that popular books collection I showed, and also our graphic novels uh, curated collection, which I didn't show today. Uh, one freshman remarked, I was surprised to find graphic novels and leisure reads. I had thought the library only as a research space. So, you know, they may not discover these things even if they're in the building wandering around, but to have them featured in curated collections is really making them stand out. We also like believe that leisure reading collections serve as an entry point to engage students with other library resources. So we're hoping that um, we're pulling more students in that way through the collections. And to gather feedback on the curated collections, we presented them to the university library's student advisory board. And this is a group of students from all different levels and fields that meet once a month during the semester to discuss the libraries, our services, our programs, and our resources. The student advisory board offered several suggestions for us to improve the collections. And one recommendation was to group related collections into sub collections for easier navigation. We are planning to put this suggestion into action by taking our faculty publication collections and merging them under one so that we'll have a main collection with sub collections based on the faculty members fields of expertise. Another called for highlighting diversity among authors, ethnic and racial backgrounds, which we thought was great. And a third proposed a collection focused on famous theorists featuring sub collections on their theories uh, to aid in both research and learning. So we're handing that one over to the appropriate subject librarian. But we really feel that these ideas indicate that students value that browsability of virtual collections for discovering relative library resources. I'm going to hand it back to Rebecca. So in terms of getting started, or if you are using something similar, maybe just some questions uh, to think about as you're generating um, collection ideas would be, you know, thinking about any faculty on campus that maybe you could collaborate with. Um, or are there any new programs being launched at your institution that, that you think will spark interest and that uh, researchers would wanna learn more about? Um, are there offices or campus initiatives that you that either the libraries are already engaging with or that you can see yourselves engaging with? And could collections be one way to do that? Um, we really see collection discovery as an opportunity to highlight what's new, um, what's special, or what's trending or even what's underappreciated or unknown in your collections um, and can really create a better way to, to browse them. And we, we gathered together just some helpful resources, things that have been helpful at UAlbany, guides, image, or icon resources, that was uh, a question um, that came up quite a lot is where, you know, how do we find images for these things? What, you know, what are good sources? What images would be okay to use? Um, so one of the things that we did was pull together resources for the librarians at UAlbany, but we will gladly share that with you. <laughs> um, so we pulled together some of those here. And we do have references. But we would open up now for any questions or any anything that you would like to discuss with us. We're happy to chat. Uh, yes, um, we are a small group today, so if you want to raise your hand and speak, um, go right ahead, or if you want to put it in the chat, that is fine as well.
I actually just wrote down the art crime collection because I know my um, my book group just read a book called The Art Forger that people were very interested in. So I am going to share that with them. So that's that's uh, very, I thought that was a very interesting one. Sounds like you have a lot of interest in that one. It's one of my personal favorites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But the and actually, um, I did I did a little poking around, and the titles in that collection are circulating. So, you know, they may have otherwise, but I don't think it hurts that they're they're highlighted in that way. That's great. Thanks for checking that. Yeah. I just popped the the link to the lib guide um in the chat just so you have it. Okay, and I know that uh, Lauren and Rebecca will be sharing their slides with me so I can um, get those out to you all as well. Uh, so you'll have all those. You don't need to be hurried, hurried, hurriedly writing notes from all the um, links. I'll send those out once I have them gathered together. Um, I know, I know that I think that there are some people on this call that have also been doing the same kind of work. So I don't know if anyone has any um, feedback from doing it themselves or things that they do differently or things that they do the same um, with doing their curated collections. It's definitely been growing um, because I remember when I was first looking around to see examples of what libraries were doing, there were not many <laughs> I could find. I was checking hundreds of Primo instances <laughs> um, and it has, been expanding. I've noticed just through providing reference services for other libraries, I'm seeing collections discovery used more and more. So uh, on the LibGuide, there is a section for inspiration. So I have included links to several libraries um, and their collections that you can check out so you don't have to do the big hunt. <laughs> Okay, you have a comment that someone's super excited to get some collections started. So you're inspiring, inspiring people. I don't know, I guess it depends on the size of the collection, but how, like how much time do people devote to this to, to make one? Well, it really, I would say it really depends. Like Lauren showed creating the, you know, mechanics of creating a collection in really just a few minutes. Um, part of that, that part of creating a collection that um, she didn't show was that figuring out what criteria to use to identify um, the items that you would want to include. And that can really vary <laughs> depending on your collection, the items that you're trying to identify and how well they are described or how easily findable they are. Um, so I would say there's a lot of variability, but it can happen very quickly. Yeah, yeah. I think two good examples of that, the art crime one, I had to identify kind of some key text and then I was checking to see, well, what are the LC subject headings? These are tagged with like, what would the best headings be to find books in this genre? Um, and then once I had those, it was very quick to plug those in and build the set. Whereas if we're trying to find um, all the books that the psychology faculty have published and they're just everywhere in the library and they're not tagged with anything, you know, to keep, keep them all together. That takes a little more hunting, a little more work to find them, identify them, you know, get the ISBN and add them into the set. And then once you have that set, now they're all linked together in this virtual collection. So it's, it's worth the work, I think, in many cases. <laughs> Okay, well, if there are no more questions or comments for today, uh, we can end a little bit early. But like I said, I will send out the slides, the recording. Um, and so, if, oh, there is one question. It is, how is how is the support for this from um, the vendor from Primo 
Alma? Um, I think it's probably comparable to their other support. Um, there are, I think typically they are responsive. They do have extensive documentation on this, I think, um, which is helpful. Um, it, it's ex libris documentation. So it it's uh, like all of their other documentation where sometimes it's way too much and also not enough. Uh, but um, I think generally their support is fine. There are a couple of known issues with the collections that are kind of seem slow to be resolved. Um, they're not the kinds of things that you can't get around or, you know, that really prevent you from using collections. But, um, you know, I, I think it's on par probably with the rest of how, how, with how they support the rest of their products, which is pretty good. But yes, there are some issues. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, well, if there are no more questions, uh, we'll close and I will send out all the resources from today. Later this week, I want to thank Lauren and Rebecca very much for pulling this together. I definitely learned a lot from this. Um, when I started, I didn't even I I didn't even know what this program would be about. So thank you so much. And um, we will Hopefully see you at a CDLC event uh, soon. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Thank everybody. you so much for having us. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you.